Well, hello, folks. Uh, welcome along to the Apologetics Academy. This is a live weekly webinar, which I run every Saturday at 8 p.m. British time, 3 p.m. Eastern, 2 p.m. Central, 12 p.m. Pacific. And every week, we bring on different scholars, apologists, thinkers, uh, philosophers, etc., from across the theological and philosophical spectrum to present on topics of interest to Christians, particularly those that pertain to the question of whether or not Christianity is true. And we also cross-examine and evaluate other worldviews and uh, systems of thought as well. Um, the normal format is we have a guest speaker present to us, and then we open up to open floor Q&A discussion and dialogue. Uh, so this evening, we are very honored to have with us Dr. Robert Marks from Baylor University. He's going to be talking to us about the subject of artificial intelligence and human exceptionalism. So without further ado, I'll turn over to Dr. Bob Marks. Go ahead, Bob. Thank you very much, Jonathan. I did want to give a shout out to Jonathan. I don't know if any of you guys listened to his interview with Julian Charles on The Mind Renewed, but if you haven't, uh, please take a listen. It's very informative because Jonathan usually is asking the questions instead of being asked the questions, and it's a great venue for that. So I guess you can see my screen right now. Thank you for inviting me back to the Apologetics Academy. Uh, this is a great, great ministry doing great and wonderful things. Now, I am told that my bandwidth here is too low, and that's what I was trying to correct. So hopefully I won't stammer too much, and we'll go, we'll, we'll go ahead to um, my lecture. I have some PowerPoints, because as an engineer, I don't have long-term memory, and I need PowerPoints kind of to, to pump me and to tell me what I need to talk about. So the title today is AI and Human Exceptionalism. And again, my name is Robert Marks. You can see my email there in case you'd like to um, contact me for any reason. So let's get on with the, um, the introduction. AI is really big in the news today. We hear it all the time. It's hyped. There's lots of interesting claims which are being made. Here you see Asimo, which is a Japanese robot named after Isaac Asimov, the great American uh, short story and novel writer of science fiction and uh, this does wonderful things because it can jog around it can dance and all sorts of other things we all know that gary kasparov was beaten by deep blue in chess so ai has dominated the world of uh, chess and exceeded the capacity of human beings uh, we know that watson beat uh, some of the best uh, jeopardy players in the world and so that's kind of a cool accomplishment for artificial intelligence. And we also know more recently that Google DeepMind beat the world champion at Go. And that is, that is really cool since Go is probably the most difficult popular board game that there is in the world. And it was the last, was the last hurdle in artificial intelligence beating board games. And apparently uh, computers are very good at beating board games, and we'll talk about that. But nevertheless, we have these, this scare which is coming up about artificial intelligence, and we have a lot of hype. And that's kind of what I wanted to address. Bill Gates uh, said on the dangers of artificial intelligence, he says, I don't understand why some people are not concerned. There is this popularized idea, which I think is garbage of a singularity, where Computers are going to overcome uh, individuals in terms of their performance. No, that isn't going to happen, and we'll tell you why. Stephen Hawking, certainly a man that I don't want to uh, question his intelligence. He's clearly one of the smartest guys in the world, but he says artificial intelligence could destroy civilization. Uh, wow. Uh, and then we hear hype about what robots are doing. Advanced robots can understand how humans think and know how the brain works. No, I think this is hyperbole. We'll talk about that. We'll talk about why we think that from basic computer science 101, that the claims of, of, um, the claims of both Hawking and of um, Bill Gates and all of so if Elon Musk are, they're overblown. And we'll see that. And we'll see, indeed, that humans are exceptional and that humans can actually do things and will always be able to do things that computers can't do. Uh, here's another thing which computers are said to do. Uh, they, they said that they can write plays. And here's a play that it wrote, which was very heavily promoted on the webs and in blogs. It's called Sunspring, and it was written by a computer. And what they do 
is they take a bunch of science fiction scripts and they feed it into a computer. And then they have that computer actually write a script, which is based on everything they've seen before. They do things similar with music. They take a lot of, uh, they take a lot of uh, compositions in one uh, genre. And uh, guess what? The computer spits out something in that same genre. And uh, so it's kind of fun. So let's look at this claim. AI writes, plays, composes music, or so it is claimed. And uh, again, it does so being trained with a bunch of examples from the same genre. So let's listen to just a clip from this play, which was lauded. Uh, Bob, are you meant to have sign for this one? Because there's no sign coming through. Oh, there's no sound? Yeah. Uh, okay, I'm right. sorry. Uh, let's see. What do I have to do? If you try unsharing your screen and then share it again, but click. Uh, okay, stop share. And, and then go share. down to share screen. And share then, screen. oh, I forgot to uh, do yeah. computer sound. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Actually, actually, you won't miss very much just because I, I did that. Okay. So let's uh, go ahead and continue with this. Okay. Can you hear it now? Yes. I was so happy and blue. I was thinking of you. I was a long, long time. I was so close to you. I was a long time ago. There's the situation with me and the light on the ship. Okay, pretty compelling, huh? Maybe kind of powerful? Well, let's see exactly what script this was taken from. This is the script which was written by the computer. He is standing in the stars and sitting on the floor. That's a good line. He takes his seat in the counter and pulls the camera over to his back. He stares at it. He is on the phone. Notice that there's no dialogue here. The people that produced the film actually put in the dialogue, the music, and all of the, uh, all of the stuff. He is on the phone. He cuts the shotgun from the edge of the room and pulls it, puts it in his mouth. He sees a black hole, a black hole in the floor leading to the man on the roof. He comes up behind him to protect him. He and starts to cry. Now, if you talk about incoherence and writing, buddy, are you back? Okay, Jonathan looks like you're here. I'm going to go ahead and assume that we're still connected. Uh, here are the things where we get these ideas about science fiction. All of these terms of um, astounding stories, uh, which was a periodical in the 60s about science fiction and all of the films, including the Schwarzenegger, the Star, uh, Star Trek, the next generation. And in the middle, hello, Dave, is the 2001 Space Odyssey. And from these, we have to extrapolate which ones are hype, but which ones might come true today? Because certainly science fiction has proven that there is a lot of interesting things that's predicted in the past that have indeed come true. Now, how do we test this? How do we test what computers can and can't do? There is so-called weak and strong AI, and we will find out that the Turing test, which many people have heard of, is actually testing of so-called weak AI, whereas strong AI will be tested by something called the Lady or the Lovelace test, which was a pro, which was proposed by Bringsjord at uh, RPI, and we'll talk about that because I think that that is a wonderful test and a great replacement for the Turing test. We will also address what the source of creativity is. Where does creativity come from? Computers can, can, can com computers become creative? Can they design something? Uh, do they, can they generate functional information and intelligence? We will answer no, and we're not alone in this. We are, we're joined by some pretty powerful people and pretty powerful intellects. Uh, one of the things that we can show by meta-analysis 
we can show that things which are non-algorithmic or non-computational uh, are exist around us all the time. We're so used to thinking everything can be done in terms of an algorithm or a step-by-step -step procedure. By definition, if it is algorithmic, it can be done on a computer. If it's not algorithmic, it cannot be done on a computer. So these are the these are the phenomena that we would like to show and actually show the limitations from basic computer science of what can and can't be done. Uh, and what in humans is outside the reach of computers? Are there things that we can do that computers will never be able to do? And I maintain that creativity, design, functional information, and intelligence are um, indeed things that a computer cannot do. And we'll address exactly why. And can these human capabilities be achieved materialistically? There are some people who actually say that, yes, you can't do all of these things, but there must be a materialistic solution somewhere. And we'll talk about some of these approaches to the materialistic solution of what we can do as people. We are amazing human singularities, each one of us. And we can do things computers can't do, but maybe if there's a materialistic answer that you know, maybe someday we will have a computer that can achieve this. And we'll talk about the current state of the art and investigating that, which is very young. So to improve non-algorithmic things, how do we prove that something is non-algorithmic? How can we prove that there are things which you can't do by an algorithm, which you can't achieve by a computer? To do this, we use something called meta-analysis. And meta-analysis is a powerful tool in disproving things. There are some classic examples, maybe some of which you have heard about uh, in Titus 1.12. It says the Cretans are always a liar, or always liars, as it said here. So if we have a Cretan and the Cretan says, the Cretan says, everything I say is a lie, then you say, well, if everything he says is a lie, he just lied. And if he just lied, then he's telling the truth. But if he's telling the truth, he just lied. And so you get this back and forth, this what I refer to as a bipolar paradox, which uh, goes around and around and around. Uh, in a great book, Douglas, Douglas Hofstetter refers to these sort of things as strange loops. You get into this loops, no, he's lying, no, he's telling the truth, no, he's lying, no, he's telling the truth. The thing is that in life, strange loops don't exist. They reveal inconsistency. And our universe, uh, hopefully, is consistent in some sense, and so we have to discard it. In apologetics, the idea of meta-analysis is used extensively. In the great book, I Don't Have Faith Enough to Be an Atheist by Frank Turek, he refers to this as the roadrunner approach to, def to diffusing uh, many of the philosophies which threaten Christianity. Again, this is not new for those that are students of apologetics, but let me go through them because we'll get very serious. They'll be kind of whimsical at first. Well, whimsical in the sense of, you know, solid math and things like that. But then we're going to get much more serious in terms of its application. We might, uh, and this is a f famous Frank Turek one where somebody says there is no such thing as truth. You ask, is that true? And of course, the answer is, well, gosh, you've just refuted it because you've claimed the truth. And that truth is there is no such thing as truth. So when you turn it, when you turn the statement on itself, it's self-refuting. We also have uh, kind of Eastern philosophy where it says there is no absolute right and wrong. All is relative. Then the response is, uh, I disagree. and then the person making the statement says you're wrong and of course he says and you're right and he says absolutely so by making that claim there is no absolute right and wrong the stater of that assumes that what he's saying is right so if he's assuming what he says is right then therefore it's a self-refuting statement and then there are some great ones only things uh, proven by science can be believed we hear this from scientism and of course the response to that is can you prove this scientifically? And the answer is no, because the original statement is not a scientific claim. It is a philosophical claim, and you can't prove it scientifically. So therefore, by applying the sentence to itself, it becomes self-refuting. So these are all fun and good. Here is a great uh, example of self-refuting from Deepak Chopra 
I hadn't heard of this guy, but I guess he's very, very famous. And here is one of the great self-refuting statements that I have ever heard on, in terms of lies. Eliza. I want to take another question. There's a gentleman in the red shirt back there. He's had his hand up for a while. Come up to the microphone. Uh, my, my question's for, for Deepak and, and uh, the bishop. Now, you stated before that all belief is a cover-up for insecurity, right? Mm -hmm. Do you believe that? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> I see. <laughs> yeah. So who got him on that? It says, the man state said, now you stated before that all belief is a cover-up for insecurity, right? Deepak says, yes. He says, do you believe that? The guy says, yes. The man says, thank you. He has totally turned Deepak's uh, statement into a, not a self-refuting statement, but actually a statement that Deepak is claiming this because he is insecure, which is, I think, very fascinating if you're to be consistent with that. Now, let's get a little bit more serious. We're not totally to the point of being serious yet, but one of the things about self-refuting statements is that they are used extensively in proving mathematics. Uh, and here's a kind of fun example. Somebody comes up. Of course, is a counting number like one, two, three, by self-refuting statement. Because what we do in the proof is we say, if there are uninteresting integers, then there is a smallest uninteresting positive integer. There is a smallest uninteresting positive integer. But, hmm, that's interesting. So we have refuted our original claim. So we have indeed a proof by contradiction that all positive integers are interesting. This again is a little bit whimsical. Uh, let's go to the next case where we get uh, even more serious. This is something called Barry's paradox. And you'll see the importance of this in something called algorithmic information theory later. Barry's paradox says X is the smallest positive integer that requires more than 20 words to define. On the face of it, this looks nice and innocent. It's the smallest positive integer that requires more than 20 words to define. But here's the problem with that in careful analysis. The statement X is the smallest positive integer that requires more than 20 words to define, that statement defines X using only 15 words. So therefore, the statement itself is self-refuting because when we apply it to itself, we see that X uh, is, is, can be defined in 15 words. So the sentence itself is self-refuting. Now, this takes a little while to sink in as you get to some of these more sophisticated uh, contradictions. Uh, let me go to one that takes a little bit more uh, thought. Uh, things are non-algorithmic, sometimes are actually unknowable. Let's take a proof which was given by Gregory Chaitin, possibly one of the greatest mathematicians of the 20th century uh, that I know of, a founder of algorithmic information theory, sometimes called Komogorov Chaitin Solomonov information theory. But here is one of his programs. He wants, to, he wants to look at computer programs. And if you think about it, if you want to compute a number like 67 or something like that, there are short ways to do that, short programs to do that, and there are long programs to do that. Chaitin hypothesized, and it's certainly true that among all of the programs, there is a shortest program to generate a specific output. And you can tell this if you look at a bank of computer programs, you give them all the same programmers, a bank of computer programmers, and ask them all to generate a program to do something. Some of those programs will be shorter and more elegant, if you will, than other programs. There does exist a shortest computer program, which is elegant. So accept that if you will. And now we're going to ask ourselves if we can write a uh, elegant program generator. That's an EPG. And here's the idea. We want to write a computer program, which actually, when we're given the output, generates the element that produces a given output. 
So here's the basic, here's the basic idea. We have any desired output. You give it any desired output. There's an elegant program generator which spits out the shortest program which will give you this result. So we're hypothesizing that there indeed exists an elegant program generator. But there is a problem with this, as noted by Chaitin. If we have this, this elegant program generator that we write has a certain length. Say it takes 10 gigabytes to write this elegant program generator. So here we have any desired output and we generate the corresponding elegant program that generates that output. So suppose the length of the ele ele elegant program generator is gigabytes. In fact, they're unbounded. You can get elegant programs for this program. So let's suppose that we give the elegant program general. I think this is a, this be 30 gigabyte. It actually generates the 30 gigabyte elegant program. Twenty words or less. The smallest integer defined by twenty, or the largest integer. No, the smallest integer defined by twenty words or less. It's it's exactly similar because here's the problem we get. If we give an in, input and we generate a thirty gigabyte elegant program, guess what we did? This elegant program generator, which only took ten gigabytes, generated thirty gigabytes of an elegant program. But this program, which generates the elegant program, is actually 10 gigabytes. So it's much shorter. So we have a, uh, it's self refuted. We do not have the ability to do that because if we could do that and we could get out 20, 30 gigabytes using a 10 gigabyte program, that 10 gigabyte program serves as a, as a better program, a shorter program than the elegant program. The elegant program was assumed to be the shortest program possible, but that's not possible. It's not possible because the elegant program generator is actually shorter than the shortest program. No, we can't have that. So this is feuding. So this is a contradiction. And therefore, it is proven by self-refuting that elegant program generators cannot exist. That is really cool. But it also exposes the elegant program generator is non-algorithmic. You can, which is an elegant program generator for arbitrarily large elegant programs. It's non-algorithmic. We are so used to thinking of things in terms of recipes of uh, do A, then B, then C, and then depending on what happens at C, either do D or E. And so we have this, this algorithm, this step-by-step -step procedure for doing things. And there are many things, including the elegant program generator, which can't be done. Now, one might say is that, uh, wait, uh, hold your taters. Um, what about the incredible computers that we have today? Well, back in the 1930s, Alan Turing, who we've heard about, he was in the movie, I believe it was called The Imitation Game with Benedict Cumberbatch, who really, really fun movie, fun in a tragic sort of way. But um, his, his thesis advisor was Alonzo Church. They both came up with methods of performing computers. Turing's method is basically what we use today. It's referred to as a Turing machine. Church used something called Lambda Calculus. They got together and they decided, you know what, both of these programs, both of these models do exactly the same thing. And anything that Church could do with his Lambda Calculus, Turing could do with his Turing machine. And the Church-Turing thesis says that even the computers we have today uh, can only do algorithms that can be done on Turing's original 1930s uh, Turing machine. Now, if we did it on Turing's machine, it would take, I don't know, a billion, a trillion times as long, but nevertheless, they can be done. So therefore, when we talk about non-algorithmic things, it doesn't matter how sophisticated the computer is, because by the Church-Turing thesis, anything that can be done today could be done back in Turing's 1930s Turing machine. 
So when we think of computational, we should think of algorithmic. We should also think of Turing machine, because if something is computational, it is algorithmic, and it can be performed on a Turing machine. This is kind of cool. Here's another classic non-algorithmic uh, problem, which was proposed by Turing. And every computer science uh, major in his freshman or sophomore or junior class is exposed to something called the Turing halting problem. And it's probably one of the first solid examples of things which are not algorithmic. Given an arbitrary computer program, I give you an arbitrary computer program, which we'll call P. And uh, it has an input, whoops, went too far. And it has an input of I. We want to see if a computer program with an input of I halts or whether it runs forever. Turing actually showed back in the 1930s that this was not possible. It is non-algorithmic. You cannot write a halting program to analyze any arbitrary computer program to say whether that computer program will halt or whether it will run forever. That's not algorithmic. You cannot write a computer program to do it. You cannot write a step-by-step -step procedure to do it. So a computer, a halting program cannot be written. The halting oracle is another example of something non-algorithmic, something that can't be done on a computer, something that can't be done on a so-called Turing machine. This is generalized into something called Rice's theorem, which says not only halting, shoot, you can't even determine whether an arbitrary computer program will print a three or not. Now, this is not to say that we can um, arbitrarily um, uh, say all computer programs won't print a three. My goodness, if you have a computer program whose first line is, say, print three, then yeah, that can do it. That, that, that program will print three. But the claim is, is that if you give it an arbitrary computer program, it cannot determine whether it will halt, whether it will print the number three, whether it will do any so-called non-trivial semantic property of the program. Halting and printing three are non-trivial semantic properties of the program. And I think this is really fascinating in terms of debunking um, the vanilla version of determinism proposed by the great atheist mathematician Laplace, Marquis de Laplace, who basically said if we knew the universe and we knew everything in the universe and uh, we knew the velocities and the positions and the acceleration, yada, 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 of all these particles, then we could predict the future. Actually, this actually isn't true because what Rice's theorem says is that we have a computer program and here's a computer program at the bottom of the screen. It's written, it's there, uh, what it's going to do is determined, but there's no way that we can look at an arbitrary program and say what it can do. So the interesting conclusion of this is that determinism does not imply knowability. Now, does this apply to the quantum world as well? Yeah, it does. And we can discuss that if somebody wants to ask about it at the end. But uh, again, determinism, just if things are deterministic, which I don't believe they are, but if they were, well, they're not. They, if things were deterministic, then we would, um, the, the, then uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that the outcome of that determinism is knowable. That is a profound implication of Rice's theorem. So let's go to now what the implications of non-algorithmic uh, processes are to the human being. Uh, I actually began to be a student of that through the work of Roger Penrose. Roger Penrose is a genius. He worked with Stephen Hawking. In fact, Penrose, I believe, was Stephen Hawking's PhD advisor. And he worked with Roger Penrose on the so-called Penrose-Hawking Singularity Theorem for Black Holes, which was just a profound work. The guy is one smart cookie. Penrose says that brains cannot create beyond their foundation experience. And he wrote two books in which he showed this. Now, Penrose is not a theist or a deist. I don't think he makes any claims at all. But nevertheless, he is a very honest man, and he reaches these conclusions just by the evidence and the mathematics behind them. Penrose says, that I think this is very telling, a human may have invented a computer, but it has not yet invented a computer that can invent a human, nor will it ever be able to do so. 
and he gives the mathematical evidence that indeed this is the case. Another statement about creativity comes from the arts world, from the novel writer John Steinbeck, who wrote What You See on Your Screen Now in East of Eden. Our species is the only creative species. It has only one creative instrument, the individual mind and the spirit of man. Nothing was ever created by two men. There are no good collaborations, whether in music and art and poetry and mathematics and philosophy. Once the miracle of creation has taken place, the group can build and extend it, but the group never invents anything. The preciousness lies in the lonely mind of man. Kind of a uh, corollary to this is the old saying that nobody ever erects a statue to a committee. It's always individual people that are leaders and creators. So let's look at some of these ideas and see exactly what might be non-algorithmic. One of the things which uh, Penrose and I, I agree is non-algorithmic is creativity. Computers, as we know them, will never have the ability to be creative. And we see evidence of this throughout history. Shown on your screen is a, a Friedrich Gauss. Many of you have heard of the Gaussian curve. In electromagnetics, there are Gaussian laws. Serving, uh, solving systems of linear equations uses a process called Gaussian elimination. The guy is possibly one of the two most brilliant mathematicians that's ever lived, the other one being Leonard Euler. Uh, here's how he explains the way he thinks. And this is, this is a recurring theme. He said, finally, two days ago, I succeeded, not on account of my hard efforts, but by the grace of the Lord, like a sudden flash of lightning, the riddle was solved. He was working on a math problem. He was trying all sorts of different ways. And then like a flash of lightning, the riddle was solved. He said, I am unable to say what the conducting thread was that connected what I previously knew, which uh, with that made by my success possible. I would imagine that most listeners of this podcast or this webinar have experienced something similar where you are just thinking along and boom, all of a sudden an idea comes to your mind and you're really not sure where it came from. This was true of Gauss. It was also true of the great electrical engineer Nikola Tesla. He uh, discovered, for example, the discovered, invented the uh, brushless motor, the linear induction machine. And uh, it was, it's profound because it's used everywhere today. His, his invention is ubiquitous. How did he get the idea for this induction machine? In his biography, he says, the idea came like a flash of lightning. And it's just the same phrase that Gauss used, flash of lightning. I think a total coincidence. And in an instant, the truth was revealed. I drew with a stick in the sand the diagram showing six years later in my address bef before the American Institute of Electrical Engineers, and my companion understood them perfectly. So therefore, Tesla and Gauss had flashes of genius, of creativity. It used to be in the United States Patent Office that in order to get a patent, you had to actually claim a flash of genius. You had to demonstrate a flash of genius in order to get a patent. That's been abandoned, and that's evident in some of the patents which are given today, but uh, it has been abandoned, uh, unfortunately. There was also a movie called Flash of Genius, which was about the guy that invented the intermittent windshield wiper and went to litigation with Ford and some other companies who copied his invention without, uh, without compensating him for it. So Flash of Genius, good movie, good movie if you'd like to see a nice popcorn movie. So here's Nikola Tesla, Gauss, both had a flash of lightning. This not only happens in technology and mathematics, it also happens in the art. Here's a guy that just passed away, I think a month or so ago, Tom Petty, and he talked about writing songs. He says, it's so hard to understand. I don't understand, but I do know that the best ones, the best songs often just appear. You're sitting there with your guitar, piano, and bang, there it is. It just falls out of the sky. He says, I hesitate to even try to understand it for fear that it might go away. It's a spiritual thing. You hear this a lot from composers, that their ideas are many times songs or motifs that actually were there and they just grabbed them out of the sky and wrote them down. This is a process of a, light, a flash of lightning creativity. 
Here's another one very shortly. Uh, it's a very short clip, but it's about Paul McCartney and his composition of Yesterday. And I just woke up one morning with this tune in my head. Um, I thought, I don't know this tune, or do I? It's like an old jazz tune or something, And I, because my dad used to know a lot of old jazz stuff. Well, maybe I've just remembered it or somewhat. So I sort of got, went to the piano, found the chords to it. You know, it was like in G, F sharp minor, seven, sort of B and that. And um, uh, kind of re just remembered it, made sure I remembered it. And then I just hawked it around to all my friends and stuff and said, what's this? You know, it's got to be something. It's like a good little tune, you know, and I couldn't have written it because I just dreamed it, you know. You don't get it that lucky. And then it happened skip that queer the next one. But you can see both Tom Petty and Paul McCartney claim this kind of flash of genius, this idea that their their songs, their creative instincts come from came from kind of nowhere. They don't know where it went. So we have creativity. How can we test creativity? That's what a good engineer or a good scientist would ask. How can we create testing? I'm sorry, how can we test creating? We can create tests very easily, but how can we test creativity? The classic is the Turing test. It's a test for intelligence in the computer requiring that a human being should be able to distinguish, unable to distinguish the machine from another human being by using uh, the replies to questions put to both. All of us have heard, I think, of the Turing test. I love this statement by Bringsjord who also came up with the Lovelace test, which we'll touch on in our few remaining minutes. He says that uh, basically that this idea of the Turing test and people trying to beat it today, they apply shallow trickery. For example, the human creators of artificial agents that compete in present day versions of the Turing test know all too well that they have merely tried to fool those people who interact with their agents into believing that these agents really have minds. The idea is that there's a goal there and the people that are writing the Turing test sort of thing are gaming those goals in order to get decent results. There was a couple of years ago, uh, Eugene Guzman, that was a computer program written that purported to be a 13 year old Ukrainian boy. And he was able to fool 75% of the people that interacted with him on a question answer basis. Well, notice, first of all, how things are cooked. Number one, 13 years old. Well, you don't have a lot of knowledge when you're 13. So if you can't answer some questions very well, you can say, hey, the kid's only 13. Give him a break. The other one, that he was Ukrainian, even though his responses were in English. So therefore, if his English kind of got screwed up, then you could excuse it because he was Ukrainian. So even there, there was kind of a... Um, a very overt attempt to fool people by saying that Eugene Guzman was a 13-year-old Ukrainian boy, and he's the one that passed the so-called Turing test. So what's the solution? By Bringsjord, it's the Lovelace test. Lovelace test will test strong AI. Weak AI is the Turing test. Strong AI is the Lovelace test. Ada Lovelace is known as the first computer programmer. She programmed for Charles Babbage's mechanical machine back in the 19th century. And she said famously, computers can't create anything for creation requires minimally originating something. But computers originate nothing. They merely do that which we order them via programs to do. So that was really cool. So Ada Lovelace has a computer language, Ada named after her. And now we have the Lovelace test, which is also named after her. The Lovelace test says strong AI will be demonstrated when a machine's creativity is beyond the explanation of its creator. The Turing test looks at the outward performance of the computer. Uh, computer program, what's happening within the code. So if I wrote a might be creative, and plus we would have a 
Cards, which was designed to play checkers, and then all, all of a sudden it went creative, especially if I didn't tell it the rules of chess, how to play chess, or anything else. Or if we have chess, a chess game that goes on to eventually give investment advice, uh, this would be something which would be above and beyond the purpose of the original, the original writer of the chess program. I was writing an evolutionary program one time, and a colleague of mine came in, and he asked, what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm writing an evolutionary program. And he says, oh, great. When will I be able to talk to it? Uh, that's hilarious because we know that program that I was writing, that the artificially intelligent program that I was writing, evolutionary computing, was going to do exactly what I meant it to do, and it wasn't go on, going on to develop lungs and eventually talk to somebody. On the left here is shown a design using evolutionary programming of a computer antenna, not a computer antenna, but an RF antenna, which was designed by artificial intelligence. But do you know what? that program was exactly written to design this antenna. And so there was no mystery about it. Now, if this program to design this antenna went on to design um, Elon Musk's recent rocket or to give investment advice without being told, then ah, all of a sudden we have to say maybe that would pass the Lovelace test. Uh, one of the things that we have to remember is that when we get surprised from a computer program, that does not necessarily mean creativity. I have been surprised. Everybody gets surprised sometimes by your computer program because usually the first thing that you write isn't, uh, isn't happening. Your, your goal doesn't happen. It screws up some way, so you get surprised. And sometimes you get kind of interesting results that you weren't expecting. That's fine, but you know what? Usually you've given them a for example, in a cert sort of problem, billions and trillions of different trials to look at, different combinations of parameters to look at, and it finds the best parameter set, and it goes, oh, this parameter set does this, and you go, oh, that's cool, but you're not surprised at it. Why is that? Because you've already placed into that computer all of the different, uh, all of the different things that it's supposed to be looking for. It's already there. You can explain it. Uh, creativity in board games. I don't know if there's a lots of creativity that you have in board games. Many of them are just sophisticated uh, lookup tables uh, that, that need to anticipate contingencies and choose the best contingency in order to uh, affect the next move. AI can only think inside the box. And this is important to remember. Remember we, did, we said that that silly... Um, uh, uh, screenplay written by a computer was generated by a bunch of different science fiction scripts being compiled by the artificial intelligence. And then in the end, it, it took all of those things and kind of shuffled them and came out with this stupid play that we saw. Well, that's in general the case. And if you generate a bunch of science fiction things and you put them all together, you're going to come out with a science fiction play. And indeed, that was the case. It's the same thing with, uh, with music. If you train a neural network or artificial intelligence with a bunch of, say, blues uh, music, if you put it in that genre, guess what? That computer program is going to spit out something which is bluesy. But if you train a computer on all of the works of Bach, guess what? It will never write something like a Stravinsky, uh, a Stravinsky piece or a Wagner piece. It won't do it. They're totally different genres of music. There were, uh, if you will, flashes of genius in, in the area of, of Richard Wagner's mind that allowed him to do this. This point was made back in 1961 by Patrick D. Wall, who at the time was at MIT. Now, believe it or not, 50 years ago, we hear a lot of hype. 50 years ago, guess what? They were doing, they were doing computer programs that played checkers, that played chess, that forecasted the weather that uh, did translations from oral utterances. That was over 50 years ago. So a lot of this stuff we're hearing today is really old news, just done on more sophisticated, higher computers, uh, higher performance computers. So let's listen to Wall. This was back in 1961, but I think his, his topic is very prophetic. I don't believe that any of the machines that we know today can think. I have a basic question 
which is, do these machines produce anything really new? When you consider the great new ideas produced by men like Newton and Darwin and Galileo, you'll find that initially they had to throw away the old rules that they'd been brought up with. Now machines do what they've been told to do. They obey the rules that have been fed into them by man. And we know of no machines at present which have means of overcoming this limitation. In other words, as you can see here, AI can only think inside the box. It can only interpolate among the data to which it has been given. It is unable to extrapolate outside of the box, as Dr. Wall said, and actually do something which is new and creative. And certainly that is something which we argue is non-algorithmic. Now, we haven't proven that. We've proven that non-algorithmic things exist, but they're not always there. Uh, because, of, because of time, I think I'll step over this next one, uh, and it's a question of whether is uh, consciousness non-computable. It turns out, well, no, I think I will play it. It's very, I will Why is it so special in the brain to understand how consciousness works? This, by the way, is Sir Roger Penrose, the same one that wrote The Shadows of the Mind and The Emperor's New Mind. Where'd you go? There you are. Why is it so special in the brain to understand how consciousness works? Well, the idea that I had, uh, because of my views about understanding being something which is not a computational activity, I needed something which involved that part of physics which, in my view, had a hope of being non-computational. And the only part of physics is that I, that I could think of then and can still only think of now is where you have a quantum system which becomes a classical system. So let me, that's a terrible place to pause it. Let me make Roger Penrose look a little bit See, this is there in the freeze frame. Uh, Roger Penrose is basically admitting that this process of creativity and this consciousness, if you will, is something which is non-algorithmic. Where do we go to look for things which are non-algorithmic? Now, Penrose, who is basically a materialist, says that it's in microtubules and it is the quantum effects in microtubules that actually generate this non-algorithmic process. Now, if Penrose is right, then, well, you know, uh, maybe the, someday we'll be able to replicate this. If we do, then I think we have to be very afraid. We're going to be stuck with things like, um, like uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger's Terminator and Skynet that took over, became conscious and took over the world. But right now, this is just speculation, and it'll be interesting to see what happens in the future. I think that the theist and the best explanation is indeed our creativity comes from possibly a higher source, that indeed it isn't neuron microtubules and the quantum effects therein. Uh, the last thing I wanted to talk about was understanding. We've talked about consciousness. We've talked about creativity. What about understanding? Understanding is basically non-algorithmic in the sense of a great argument which is put forth by John Searle called John Searle's Chinese Room. Now, I'm going to butcher this a little bit, and this is not exactly Searle's Chinese Room, but the idea is that there's a lady in a room. That room is a little... The way she does this is that there are a number of books there. There are a number of file cabinets you can't see. And she begins to look at this English, a match for her, and then she slips it out of the slot. Now, here's the question. It looks like from the outside that the lady in the Chinese room knows Chinese and can do translations from one language to another? And the answer is no. She has no idea what English is. She has no idea what Chinese is. She's simply looking for pattern matching in a table lookup in order to affect the result. She has no understanding of what is going on. Uh, in a similar, Searle's Chinese room originally addressed the Turing machine test where a question would be asked and the lady instead of looking up a translation would look up a response that had already been programmed if you will into the computer 
And just because she was able to give a response to the question in English didn't mean she understood the question, didn't mean she understood the response. She was just following an algorithm. There is no understanding which exists in computing. So we maintain that understanding, <clears throat> excuse me, we, we maintain that understanding is also non-algorithmic and is something that a computer will never be able to do. So here's our conclusion and I'll wrap up here. Our brains are beyond algorithms and therefore beyond computation. Creativity, consciousness, and understanding are non-algorithmic and therefore non-computable. Therefore, if this is true, anybody coming forth and say computers can be conscious or understand things or be non or, or be anything algorithmic, uh, they're wrong. That is never going to happen. This does not mean that AI is going to have a profound effect on our society. It does not mean that AI is going to be dangerous. There are, if it's not managed right, there will be great dangers coming from AI. But it does mean that these non-algorithmic phenomena will be things which are never the result of computing. Intelligence is the source of creativity. So therefore, whatever it is in our minds, our God-given ability to create or these effects of quantum effects and microtubules, uh, that is the source of creativity. And currently it's available in humans, but not available in computers. Is there a materialistic solution? Roger Penrose thinks so. But I tell you, I think that any, if he is true, and if he is true, you know, that, that's fine. But if, it, but, but if it is true, we are just years and years from showing that, unless there's some incredible flash of genius by somebody that figures this out. Uh, is it knowable? We didn't get into this because of lack of time, but there's many things which exist that can be proven to be unknowable. And it might be our meta-ability to analyze ourselves is something which can't be done. It might be not knowable. It might be unknowable, I think I should probably say. So uh, this just comes to the fact when we look at our brains, we look at Psalm 139, 14. It says, I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. And if you look at what our brain does, the creativity, the consciousness, the understanding, indeed, we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Uh, let me end by plugging my book. This is some of this material is covered in the last chapter of Introduction to Evolutionary Informatics, available as everything else in the world is on Amazon.com. And uh, of course, I'd pitch our website, evoinfo.org, where if you want to look at the deeper mathematics of some of these things which are happening, this is the place to go. So, with this, uh, that finishes it, and I'll hand it over to Jonathan. Oh, thank you, uh, Dr. Marx. I do want to unshare your screen. Quick. Oh, I'm going to unshare my screen. Okay. So you can see my wonderful face. Yes, exactly. Okay. Well, um, <laughs> so there I am. Hi, everybody. <laughs> thank you, Dr. Marx. That was really uh, fascinating. Um, folks, this is the interactive portion of the program. If you would like to uh, ask a question, then click the raise hand button on your screen, and I'll be happy to promote you to the list. You can also submit questions in textual form by hitting the Q&A button at the top of your screen, and you can also uh, submit it anonymously if you wish. Um, an anonymous attendee uh, says, so what you were basically saying is we do not need to worry about a Terminator movie scenario. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I think that in terms of uh, current computers, and the Church Turing thesis that no computers will never be conscious and uh, overtake us. Um, so no, that isn't going to happen. Computers will never be conscious. So we will not have Skynet, and uh, that sort of thing will not happen. Now, will AI be dangerous? Yeah, there are different ways that AI is going to be dangerous. But in terms of making a conscious decision to take over, no, that isn't going to happen. Mm -hmm. Um, anyone else I want to ask uh, a question of Dr. Marks? Currently there's no questions submitted. Two minutes. Well, I might mention that, uh, um, there are a lot of science fiction scenarios which are very interesting. Uh, I don't think the matrix will ever happen. 
Uh, if you're familiar with uh, 2001 of Space Odyssey, where you had Hal taking over, now I would maintain that that is not Hal taking over because of consciousness. I would maintain that is a danger of AI because Hal was programmed to give greater importance to the mission than it was to human lives. So I would maintain that would be an example of a program glitch. There was nothing to do with consciousness or anything there. The computer program was actually just following instructions. Mm -hmm. And anonymous attendee asks, what do you think about driverless cars? I guess he means, do you think that's a possibility? Driverless cars. Uh, yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, let me respond by saying AI is going to be dangerous in the scenarios which it doesn't consider. In order to have a successful self-driving car, you're going to have to deal with all of the different scenarios that a driverless car is going to. Uh, I heard a talk one time of this driverless car. I won't mention, I won't mention who it was, but they were going really great and they had gone for a long time and everything was working flawlessly. And then a plastic bag flew across the front of the car and the car didn't know what to do. The car didn't know what to do because it was not trained for that contingency. And so this, that, this is always going to be a problem with AI or what things are not contained in the contingencies for which the car was trained. And uh, we have to be careful about that. And I noticed that a major car company actually came to the United States and say they wanted a blessing on their car, uh, their driverless car. How do you do that? How do you test whether a car is safe or not? What you would have to do is put it through a battery, battery of tests. Those tests, of course, could be gamed in some sort of fashion. But you have to make sure that there are coverage of all scenarios. You're not going to be able to cover all the scenarios. So I suspect the driverless cars are only going to be um, acceptable when their mortality rate, the people that they kill, is far below that which we see with human cars. And there's a number of ways to achieve this. One of, I think it was the ex, um, the ex president of GM or somebody said that probably in uh, 10 years the driving would be outlawed. No humans would be allowed to drive. Why is that? Because if you just had driverless cars, what would happen is all of these contingencies would be removed. It would just be computers talking to each other and you would remove the uncertainty there. I also think that maybe driverless cars will be very good when highways are kind of like railroad tracks. You have the clear white lines on one side and you have all the cars talking to each other. So yeah, I think it can be done. But again, the, the big problem, this is danger in AI, is not taking into account all of the contingencies which might happen in a scenario. And I think that that indeed is probably impossible. And no matter what you do, you're going to have fatalities with, uh, with cars. So. An anonymous attendee asks, how credible do you think the claims are that Deep Blue's win over Kasparov was the result of cheating of some kind? You know, I'm not familiar with that. I have no reason to believe that uh, Deep Blue was totally honest um, in, its, in its dealings with, uh, with Kasparov. Uh, I read somewhere that one of the proofs that artificial intelligence will never be human is that Deep Blue, after its success, didn't celebrate it didn't go out on a night on the town with deep pink. It didn't, uh, it didn't get excited. It just, somebody just shut it down. It went back to sleep. So there were, no, there were no human attributes to deep blue. I like the phrase about it didn't go out on the town with uh, deep pink to, uh, to celebrate. So no, I don't believe that there was any, any cheating that I know of. Because uh, after the match in 1997, you know, uh, Kasparov accused IBM of cheating because the computer... Kasparov thought was making very human-like moves at certain points and so he thought that perhaps there was a human that was having input into the machine's uh, choice of moves. Well, we have to remember that there is um, one of the places of like human creativity and human exceptionalism which I think is going to be emerging is so-called crowdsourcing and if you will man in the loop sort of scenarios for artificial intelligence. Um, Watson, who won at Jeopardy, for example, was trained extensively with humans in the loop. The humans looked at the performance, as you know, this performance of, of Watson isn't exactly the way that we anticipate it, so we have to tweak it here. Well, you know, it's not doing what we want, so let's tweak it here. So certainly there was a man in the loop, the creativity in the loop, which was part of the training of, of Watson. 
So if there were human-like moves, I don't know. Um, I don't think a lot of people could actually beat Kasparov. So if they did have human type of moves, they probably pretty chose a pretty good chess player in order to beat Kasparov. And that would be hard to keep quiet because if, uh, because if I did it, I want to say it wasn't deep blue. It was, me. it's one of, it's one of those conspiracy things, which you have a hard time, uh, hard time keeping quiet. I think. I think one of the reasons why Kasparov came to that conclusion is that in the first game of the match, he absolutely demolished deep blue. And then the second and following um, he was yeah, really he got beaten the second match, the second game and then he eventually lost the match and so he was uh, he was very shocked that he had such an easy time in the first game and then after that suddenly it changed okay um, so yeah I don't know I, again I think it would be one of these conspiracies it's like uh, if, if, if I can go a biblical example Christ's resurrection if it was indeed a conspiracy it would be very hard to keep it quiet I think the same sort of argument could apply here. If indeed a human was helping, it would be hard to keep quiet, mm -hmm. especially if you had a big ego of a big chess champion, which I think all big, all chess champions have big egos. I don't know any chess champions, but that's what I think. <laughs> um, let's see. Um, Mark McGee says, what do you think artificial intelligence will look like at the end of the 21st century? That's a great question. There is a, there is a great, Quantum physics. We can probably predict things within a year or two, but I think at the end of the 21st century, I don't know. I've looked back in history at great people that have made forecasts, great scientists that have made forecasts and have totally made fools out of themselves. Lord Kelvin, for example, said that uh, we're going to run out of oxygen in, you know, f I think in 2020 or something. So we have to watch out for that. He said that um, Lord Kelvin, he, just famous for, for great misquotes. He said that heavier than air uh, flying is just a dream. It's, it'll never happen. He said the the power of the atom will never be harnessed. Uh, and, and so these are great minds and great people that tried their very best to make forecasts far into the future, and they were all just jerks. And I think this is one of the great things about non-algorithmic creativity. Creativity cannot be anticipated. And once you see an element of creativity, it changes things in a way that are unexpected, and I believe not being able to be forecast. Uh, Douglas Feather asks, you established that there are things that are non-computable. Has it uh, been shown that humans are capable of calculating or determining any of these things? That's an excellent question, and the answer is no. I think a lot of the arguments that are made are I think we have qualitative tests that will never be accomplished. And here's, here's, here's the fun part. If you actually prove things are non-algorithmic, proofs themselves are kind of algorithmic. So we would have to be doing an algorithmic proof that things are not algorithmic. Now we've done that with the Holton problem and the uh, elegant program generator, for example. But uh, with humans, it's going to be much more difficult. Uh, I believe, though, that as an engineer, one of the things that we do is attempt to reduce things to practice. And once we've reduced things to practice, it ends up, ends all debate. Many times when a new technology comes forth, everybody says, no, this can't happen, that can't happen. And then you reduce it to practice and the military or somebody else begins to use it and it removes the debate. So the question is, is that human creativity, can it be done uh, in a consistent way above and beyond the computer? And I think it can. I think the crowdsourcing is an example. I believe that it's always the existence of a man in the loop. I think that many arguments are actually irrefutable that will ID or AI, will AI ever uh, be a good coach on a volleyball team? I don't think so. I have a son-in-law that's a coach on a volleyball team. There just isn't that human interaction. You're never going to do that. Will it ever be a good CEO? Will it ever be a good interviewer like Jonathan? I don't think so because it takes that spark of creativity that does this, and uh, I think that we're going to accumulate evidence. The great physicist Stephen Hawking actually said, and I love this quote, 
although I think Stephen Hawking has kind of gone wacko in the last few years. But he said, nothing in physics is ever proven. We just accumulate evidence. So therefore, if we talk about gravity, we have never proven gravity, but boy, we have a lot of evidence that gravity exists. I think that same sort of scenario is going to be applied once we begin to think about this in terms of human creativity and understanding, and this is, as it is applied both in the scientific, the business, and other areas. Um, an anonymous attendee asks, do you think artificial intelligence will be used to analyze Christian apologetics arguments? <laughs> well, I think real intelligence has, and uh, real intelligence, I think, is uh, yeah, irrefutable. One of the problems with AI is that you always have to put some sort of bias in it. We see this, for example, in the, um, oh, say the Google search uh, algorithms, for example. There's always a bias of what is favored and what is not favored. We see this in exclusion of, of videos on YouTube. So there's always this bias that is put in um, either intentionally or not intentionally. So no, you're never going to get an objective, an objective count on that. I think if an atheist writes it, yeah, it'll tear it all up, at least by their account. But I think if somebody who is um, knowledgeable about it writes it, maybe disinterested, the problem is it's hard to find somebody disinterested. If you find somebody disinterested, maybe they can. Uh, Dan asks, so um, impossible to eventually download our consciousness into computers, uh, question mark, because the problem is not technological, but inherent in the nature of consciousness? Yes, exactly. Uh, let's assume, for example, that our creativity is a result of these, of these quantum effects and microtubules. If they are that, then no, we cannot download our, our being, our consciousness into today's computers. If we downloaded our consciousness, it would have to be into a computer that was able to simulate these quantum tubules, if that indeed is the right answer. If indeed our creativity and our non-algorithmic nature is, is from God, then gosh, that'll never happen. But then you get to these kind of touchy philosophical questions. What if you clone yourself? You know, what, what happens there? I've always thought that cloning was kind of like having a, uh, a twin brother that was like 30 years younger than you. So I don't see any problem there. But there's talk now about taking human brains and transplanting them into pigs or something of that sort in order to do stuff. Well, what if those transplanting of the quantum tubules did something? I think that maybe that is something that could be testable by somebody that's really, really intelligent. Because indeed, if it is the quantum tubules, then you know, maybe the pigs would end up talking to you after a while or something. So. Uh, do, um, Ju Julie Miller asks, do the limits of strong artificial intelligence suggest that the physicalistic philosophy of human nature is wrong and some sort of dualistic philosophy of human nature should be considered? Oh, I don't understand that question. Could you translate it? Or read it again and I'll listen more closely mostly this time. So she's asking about, um, so the question is, do the limits of strong artificial intelligence suggest that the f physicalistic philosophy of human nature is wrong and some sort of dualistic philosophy of human nature should be considered? So it's basically a question of dualism versus materialism. Uh, uh, certainly, I think that you can make arguments on both sides. I think that Roger Penrose still believes that there's a materialistic solution to it because the old saying, when you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. If you're materialistic, then yeah, there has to be a materialistic solution to it. And the only thing that they can think of is this translation from quantum states to uh, classical states. That's the only place you can see non-algorithmic things taking place. Uh, if indeed that is the case, then um, if indeed that isn't the case, and we are given these, these attributes from a creator or some, some higher power, then of course that's never that that's going to uh, point towards towards a creator in some fact. Uh, there's also a troubling area which I didn't get into. Not troubling, but I think actually fascinating. That there are things which exist that we will never know. There is a field of algorithmic information theory which makes all of the science fiction I read as a kid look boring. But it actually says that there are things that exist that we can prove are unknowable. So maybe this is one of those things that exist which are unknowable. 
And I think that we see this throughout uh, theism a lot. Things exist which are, are unknowable, yet it's indirectly accumulated about that supposed unknowability. Um, someone asks, uh, hey, Professor, it's Caio here from Brazil. So what about the research programs that try to insert morality in AI, such as driverless cars? Um, Driverless cars, for example, I think we've addressed that. Can this start more dangers and solutions since the world today is decaying morally? Did you hear that? No, I didn't. Oh, sorry. I, uh, could sorry. you repeat it, please? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so someone asked, um, what about the research programs that try to insert morality in AI, such as driverless cars, for example? Could this start more dangers than solutions since this world today is decaying morally? Well, yeah, this is an interesting thought. We're actually having here at Baylor a, a forum on AI and ethics. And my stance on that is AI is never responsible for something. I learned from one of our philosophers here is something called the trolley problem, where you have a trolley and you can switch tracks and one of them takes out three great scientists and the other one takes out uh, a mother and her three little babies. And which one do you, which one do you choose? How do you do that ethically? The point is, is that if AI chooses something, the, the responsibility is not on AI, it is on the programmer. The programmer has not considered that contingency, that contingency is, uh, decision has already been made. So in no way is AI gonna be responsible for what it does. It is gonna be the programmer, the people that test the programmer. Those are the ones that are ultimately going to be responsible. So I don't know if that answers the question or not, but uh, that's my feeling. AI will never be responsible in any sense of morality. AI will not have morality. Um, and AI will not have ethics. It will right. do what we tell it to do. Computer programs do what we tell them to do. Right. And then, uh, of course, that has implications in regards to uh, physicalism and the difficulty of uh, holding that people uh, morally culpable for their actions if we are simply reducible to um, chemical reactions, firing synapses, material constituents of the brain, then in what sense can you call us moral or immoral? Um, because you, you, That's a good point. you can't accuse a, a programming script of being immoral because it just does what it does. And likewise, uh, unless we are conscious, unless consciousness and agency are actually real and not illusory, it seems very difficult to ground ethical norms and duties and values in the world. Um, and so that seems to be an argument for theism, if indeed um, moral culpability is something we want to uphold. Would you agree? Yes, I would. And I, I would agree that kind of as a corollary, AI will never be theistic. It doesn't have the ability to understand theism. Right. It is all going to be on our responsibility. And if we were like AI, then the problems that you mentioned do crop up. Absolutely. Right. Um, anonymous attendee asks, what is the possible relevance of AI for eschatology pre A or post millennium? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. That's above my pay grade. I, I, will, I will pass on that. Uh, I don't know. Anonymous, anonymous attendee asks, so Star Trek seems to be at least partially right about the future. If we start into the 23rd century, the enterprise uh, relied on AI or what they referred to as computer to a certain extent, but many positions on the ship were still humanly or alien run for the exception of data. Yeah, that's true. And of course, data was so wonderfully programmed, you cannot detect the difference between data and a real human being. This is a theme in, in computers and science fiction. One of, my, one of the greatest films I ever saw was uh, AI, starring Joel Osment, I believe. He was the guy that played the little kid in, um, where he said, I see dead people. Uh, what was the name of that? Um, dum, 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 dum. I forget what the name of it was, but an incredible actor. But then in there, he played a little boy who was a robot that could be programmed in order to, uh, in order to imitate 
human uh, responses. And there was this one place in there where he was activated in front of his mother. And before the activation, he was just standing there and they pushed the button to activate him. And this acting, this kid acted so well, you could just see his whole being filled with love and attraction for his mother. Now, did that happen? No, he was programmed to do that. That's the reason that the Turing test doesn't work. I imagine that the programmers of this little robotic boy programmed him to do exactly that. And uh, just because he simulated those human emotions doesn't mean that he felt those human emotions. And we see that today in marketing. I call it seductive optics because um, we, we, we like to see robots and artificial intelligence that are embodied in robots and things like that. Why? Because I kind of look like that. That's something I can identify with where actually artificial intelligence has nothing to do with the package in which it's placed. But we put it in this Asimo sort of robot and have it able to do things because we relate better to it. This goes back way in the 1960s when they had Robbie the Robot and also the original TV series Lost in Space, where they had these robots that were kind of semi-human. Why? Because we could relate to them a little bit better. I imagine that true artificial intelligence will be something more like HAL in 2001, where it just sits there and kind of talks to you. It doesn't need to have arms and legs and a mouth. Uh uh, Glenn Gardner on Facebook asks, um, are there any examples of AI observing humans playing any game for which it had not already been programmed? And without any further programming, being able to play that game within the rules of the game? Yes, exactly. One of the things about AI, which is used extensively, is uh, things like neural networks or regression machines, which actually learn from examples. And this is, uh, this is a very popular use of artificial intelligence. There's an underlying program, but the program tells the uh, computer, the artificial intelligence, what to observe. And then after a while, it begins to understand through the observation. So it is possible to have a non-algorithmic, well, it's still algorithmic, but it is not initially programmed into the computer. But the computer is actually programmed to watch instantiations of certain things in order to make decisions and learn from those examples, much like reinforcement learning, if you will. Uh, a popular one is like in, in deep learning, uh, de convolutional neural networks, where you, you train, uh, you have 50,000 different dogs, pictures of dogs, and 50,000 different pictures of cats, and 50,000 different pictures of horses. And you train the neural network on this. And then after you're done, you show it a picture that it hasn't seen before, and the neural network will go, oh, that's a horse, or oh, that's a, uh, that, that's a, that's a dog. So you do have that ability through repetitive observation of performance to uh, respond to that. So indeed, that is, that is a possibility. Uh, Andrew Jones asks, what do you think about AlphaGo Zero? The claim is that the computer found strategies that humans had never found. Well, yeah, certainly. I think that if you look back to the original person that wrote uh, chess, chess uh, artificial intelligence for chess, it was Claude Shannon, who also was the genius in 1948 that found a communication theory which makes your, makes your cell phones run so well today. Uh, but Claude Shannon actually came up with an algorithm that he implemented for very uh, small chess games. And the problem was at the time, he only had a few he only had the ability to look forward to a number of different um, number of different moves. And if you think about it, if you have a board, that board is going to have a tree of possibilities of different moves. And then what is going to happen after that move? If you make this move, then these moves could happen. If these moves happen, you can make these moves happen. So you go a tree of all possible contingencies. And the genius of this is to try to figure out which one of these tree branches you should go down in order to effectively um, to effectively play the game. Now, in AlphaGo, as my understanding is, that we have a similar sort of situation. AlphaGo has to decide where it's going to lay the next little flat marble. I don't know what they call them, but uh, therefore there's this tree that has grown as, as far as all of the different contingencies. Because of the power and the availability of the computer, now we can look at these trees more deeply, and we can look at... Uh, at all of the contingencies more deeply and better choose which the next move is in order to maximize our, uh, our, our success. 
The irony is, as I understand that current chess games, I'm not sure about Go, but I know with current chess games, they still follow the same basic strategy that Shannon came up with in the 1950s. It's just that computers have become much more powerful and much more, uh, much more sophisticated. Now, it's clear they're not using the vanilla version of what Shannon used, but they're using a variation of it, is my understanding. So, yeah, of course, they're, they're doing things because how many... If you think of this tree of all of the possibilities as it grows, how deep could you think a human mind can, can go with this tree? I don't think it can go very far. But I think that a computer can actually go much more in depth and find different scenarios that no human has ever thought about before because they can't dig the tree deep enough or they can't grow the tree big enough and keep it all up here in the mind. So, yeah, I, you know, that doesn't bother me. And it, um, yeah, I find it very interesting that on board games that artificial intelligence is just doing great and wonderful things I, that it, it isn't surprising at all because there you have you, know, you have a very specific problem and you have great things going on now if go if this program if alpha go went on and did something like uh, started to give investment advice like we talked about with the lovelace test then i would be surprised but as long as it just continues to play Go and, and look at these different contingencies and different results and, um, and actually have games with itself, AlphaGo has, as I understand, has games with itself, um, then, uh, yeah, there's going to be new strategies which are covered. But I also think that we have to be careful in these sort of things that I think that the, I'm one of the few people that think that the, um, there's still question about, uh, about Go and whether or not it can be broken or not. We found out that deep convolutional neural networks can be broken very easily right now. In other words, they do great things, but you, you tweak it a little bit off center and it begins, there's some scenarios where the entire thing falls down. And uh, I, I haven't followed AlphaGo that very much, but I, I just wondered if somebody was given uh, half a million dollars and a couple of years grant that they could, they could probably break AlphaGo. Now, AlphaGo, on the other hand, will begin to adapt around these new ways of beating it. But nevertheless, that's what I think. The chess program uh, Hydra, which beat uh, Michael Adams some years ago, uh, was able to calculate something like uh, 40 million positions a second. <laughs> pretty. There you go. Pretty fast. Uh, and how much do you think its opposition could compute? Mm, yeah. Not as many. Not, Not as, as many. many. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, it's... it's, it's uh, it's exciting, but I, I guess to me, it's not that surprising. Yep. All right. Well, there's no more questions, so I think we can wrap up. Thank you, Dr. Marks, for coming on and sharing your expertise and time with us. It's been much appreciated. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Jonathan. It's always, always great to see you and hear your voice. <laughs> always an honor. Thanks for coming on, and we should have you on again sometime in the future also. All right. Okay. Well, have a great night. Okay, thank you very much. Bye-bye.